Hi, thank you for joining CSO Connected today. I'm Tamara McMillan, and I'm here to speak with Louis Fernandez about a topic I think we all know and care very much about, and that's sales and marketing alignment. Sometimes this is thought of as a relationship between frenemies. Maybe it's the Capulets and the Montagues, but whatever it is, we know that it's not always easy to achieve but incredibly important for the success of the business. So we're gonna dive into that topic a bit, but first let's hear a little bit more about Louis. Now, Louis, you are the founder of Magnitude 10. Can you yes, tell us correct. a little bit about what that business does? So we are a marketing and sales consultancy that consults into predominantly tech organizations based in the UK, uh, helping them get sales and marketing alignment working so that they can then drive their pipelines and their revenues. So when we think about sales and marketing alignment, mm -hmm. it can mean a lot of different things. Yeah. So when you're taking on these projects, how are you defining that for your clients? What does it really mean to have sales and marketing aligned? So again, I think it's important to define what we mean by that sales and marketing alignment piece. And for me, it tends to be where we're looking particularly at the funnel, looking at pipeline, looking at driving revenue, looking at driving growth. And that's something that both of these departments in organizations will have responsibility for. Mm -hmm. But generally it's been because they haven't aligned around metrics that I think you end up with a disconnect in those organizations. So when you say metrics, are you, are you thinking of specific KPIs in yes. terms of whether that's conversion rates or number of leads in or yes. amount of revenue generated? Yes, I think that's exactly the, the, the nail on the head. Um, if you think about how a lot of B2B marketing organizations have been measured historically, it has been exactly around number of leads generated. It has been around the infamous MQLs and SQLs. It's not been about revenue. It's not been around conversion because those metrics have tended to sit fairly and squarely with sales. Now, if you're measuring two entirely different things and you're compensating people based on entirely different things, yeah. trying to get alignment, I would suggest, is going to be somewhat tricky. Yeah, so I think the first thing, that the first pearl of wisdom perhaps is around making sure that they're not only aligned on the objectives, which I think everyone would agree it's ultimately to drive revenue for the organization and profitability, but that actually how we incentivize and reward them for achieving those objectives Absolutely. needs to have some common ground. Absolutely. And I think it's one of these things that, you know, again, if we say that we are all working together to achieve a revenue number, which let's face it, that's what marketing and sales is there to do. Yeah. And we understand that by achieving the revenue number, that's how we're all going to be rewarded and compensated. You get people working together much more closely. Well, and I think I've also noticed, and I'm curious if you've experienced this, that as more businesses shift their compensation models in sales further down towards profitability and not just revenue, yep. this is almost where if sales and marketing aren't aligned, you see the gap expand because mm -hmm. Product marketing, for example, may be launching new features and benefits to products that aren't even that profitable, which sales is never going to want to sell because then they won't get paid. Do you see this as a new challenge? So I think that where organizations have brought together sales and marketing, they've done so in a way whereby people understand what the market wants and agree with what the market wants across that entire continuum. Yeah. The challenge, I think, comes going back to the product marketing side is if you have people working in isolation and, and we've developed something in product marketing or product management even that we believe the market wants without ever really testing it with the customer. And I've seen that happen on occasions. I, I, yeah, I think we all have, definitely. Then on the flip side of it, at the other end of the funnel, you then have the sales guys who have a different opinion because they'll say, this is what we believe the market wants, but generally that's based on, this is the last thing I sold. Or, or the cu customer yelling the loudest. Or the customer the yelling the loudest, yeah. when actually that may or may not be the right thing. Yeah. And it's certainly not representative of the market. You then have a third view, which is almost the management view, that says, we need to sell more of this product or service over here because it has the highest revenue on it, 
which then goes back to the point you made earlier on tomorrow, where it is around profitability. Yeah. It might have a large revenue number attached to it, but is it actually profitable? And when you go into the deals and understand how those deals operate, yes, it's been had a large ticket value. It's probably been incredibly complex as a sales cycle. It's probably taken you away from your core products and services, mm -hmm. and you've had to effectively customize some stuff. <laughs> it's then going to be difficult to serve. And actually, by the time you've actually done it, which has been difficult, and you've had to bring in you know, additional resources that you wouldn't normally have, that deal could well be underwater. So looks great on paper in terms of the headline number. Dig down a couple of levels and not necessarily a great deal. So right at the beginning of that, agreeing yeah. what products and services we will sell based on what the demands are from the market as a whole, which is research that would be conducted by marketing and ratified by sales through actual conversations, then you have the start and the foundation of that sales and marketing alignment. Yeah. I think we often think about sales and marketing alignment, particularly around the acquisition of new customers. Yes. Um, but what about, what are the key things or the benefits for the existing base? Because let's face it, 80% of revenue is going to come from the existing customers year on year, right? Maybe even more. Mm -hmm. um, so we focus a lot of our effort and energy on winning the new customers, which we all do need. But there's this massive demand and how we work together on the existing customers, I think, is equally important. It is. And I think one of the, the key metrics, again, that an organization would need to look at is churn. Because it's great that we fill the funnel and we concentrate on filling the funnel and we do, do a load of revenue that, that keeps on filling that. If we're not looking after our existing customers, it's not even necessarily just about upsell, cross-sell opportunities and creating those in particular accounts. It is about retaining that revenue because what is the stat? Um, the stat is something along the lines of, you know, it's six times more expensive to bring yeah. in a new account than it is to retain an existing one. In which case, if you've had all those upfront costs of bringing in new business, why on earth wouldn't you then service it in a way that encourages retention? Absolutely, absolutely. So what do you think the challenges are within the, the individual people within the marketing organization and the sales, do you think that they would like to work together if they were equally motivated and incentivized? Or is it that there is some true mm, disdain for one another in the efforts that we make? So, so let's start off with a, a maxim that I believe in, which is very much, I don't believe anyone comes to work in the morning to do a bad job. So if you start I with that- I they agree. Uh, if you start with that as your main premise, the people want to do the right thing. That's the first thing. Where I think it breaks down, though, is where people don't necessarily understand or appreciate what their counterparts do, are doing, how tough those jobs can sometimes mm. be, or how it then relates to other things that they are doing. So it's, it's almost about walking a mile in each other's shoes. Yeah, and if you have shared KPIs or objectives or metrics that you're measured and compensated against, that becomes that much easier, doesn't it? Because Absolutely. Because we, we have something that we share in common. So your success is my success. Um, outside of things like the KPIs and the compensation models, what part does the culture of the business play in sales and marketing achieving alignment? Massive. And I think it's one of these things that, um, you know, what was it, um, uh, Michael Porter I think it was, who said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So um, it's really important, I think, to make sure that you do have that cultural alignment and that appreciation between different departments. And that, you know, even from a leadership perspective, we're seeing more of the installation of chief revenue officers mm -hmm. that have responsibility for both marketing and sales. Yeah. And I think that again, start to bring together that whole alignment piece because it, it, it requires a slightly different skill set. Who do you think is ultimately responsible for sort of facilitating sales and marketing alignment? Absolutely. It's the CEO who's fundamentally responsible for bringing sales and marketing together. The role of the chief executive is basically to deliver on the top line, make sure there's not too many costs through the P&L, and then deliver on the bottom line so that you effectively are driving share price performance and earnings per share in most commercial 
organizations. It might be slightly different in uh, the third sector, but you know, that, that, yeah. that if we work on that as the, the main premise of what people are trying to do, that's your starting point. In order to do that and drive that to top line, you have to make customers aware of who you are, get their interest, turn that interest into a desire to actually work with you, and then promote action, which is the getting the deal done. And through that ADA model, different people are responsible for it. Because if people aren't aware of what you do and you haven't got your case studies in place and nobody started um, you know, really trying to go to the market and make people aware of what it is that you're doing and how it can positively affect and impact their businesses, wh- why are they gonna talk to you? Yeah. So, and that's the piece from a sales activation point of view that marketing, I believe, is responsible for. And then it's the whole handover process to somebody to manage the process of the sale while still being supported by marketing, creating great collaterals, creating great experiences, making sure that you know customers are engaged. And we, we talk about customer experience all the time. Why on earth would we not look to deliver a great customer experience through the sales cycle? I think you're just leading in the direction that I was thinking as well, which is ultimately when you have great sales and marketing alignment, um, you create happy customers because totally. the message that we took to the market is the message that the salesperson sold in the market and then it is what is received by the customer. Um, do you find to that end that companies that may have um, customer forums where they get stakeholders in and they're engaged with marketing and sales, does that help drive the alignment um, almost out of a state as necessity because the customer becomes the common driver. So it's not just pushed down from the top, but it's sort of brought into the organization externally. I think it's certainly a facet to that. And I can't begin to tell you how useful in my career I found customer advisory boards. Yeah. You know, where you bring some of your top customers together to meet with the executives in the organization. And, you know, that sales and marketing alignment, you are not there to explicitly sell anything. You are there to listen and to then maybe offer some thoughts about where you think the industry is going and qualify that with your customers. So it helps you on product roadmap. It helps you on industry understanding. It helps you on, you know, how well are we serving our customers truly? It helps you on how you're going to position your propositions and how you're then going to drive your business over the next 18, 24, 36 months. Yeah, so I always think of it as like truth serum. Exactly. <clears throat> when you have a customer advisory board, they, they are telling you like it is. And I think the challenge is always that, you know, sales tends to be a bit more emotional with the feedback that they get from a customer and the desire to please them. Uh, marketing can be a bit cerebral because this is what the analysts say and what the market is dictating. But when you bring the customer in, they actually bring the, the honest reality. And the fact of the matter is predominantly the customers we need to be concerned about are the ones that we have. Yes. And then we need to be thinking of the adjacent customers who are the ones that we want to get that look enough like the ones we have so they don't overly stretch the organization, but they do allow us to grow market share, perhaps to yes. go into new avenues of um, revenue or products or services. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's exactly that discipline that you're talking about, whereby, you know, marketing and sales, it's part art and part science. And we sit there and we think, you know, as you rightly say, there, there is the science part in terms of what are the things we need to be uh, sort of monitoring across the macro environment, the micro environment, getting that great intelligence together so that we then have a way of positioning our propositions in ways that are relevant to and resonant with the audiences we actively want to engage with. And that, that again, is something that marketing can absolutely do. Then taking that message to individuals within the target organizations we want to work with, that is absolutely where sales needs to be aligned to that to be able to do that effectively. And if we all have singing off the same hymn sheet, yeah. we end up with much better results. Absolutely. So it sounds like very practical things like team building can actually be an important thing to get yes. people on the same side and to sort of look as opposed to two organizations, it's one team with a common goal. And it, it all sounds actually fairly embarrassingly simplistic, but executing it can be incredibly, incredibly difficult. Yes. Um, do you think any of that has to do with where the budget sits around the different marketing activities? Partly, yes. Um, and I think that 
you know, if if you are in a marketing department, you've got a lot of different things that you have to deliver against. Some of them will be sales activation activities. Some of them will be brand activation activities. Yeah. And it's it's not always seen that brand activation actually is a sales mechanism. Though really at the top of the, the very top of the funnel where you're talking about defining who are suspects <laughs> in our universe of people that we could be talking to, that's exactly where brand comes in. You know, and people subconsciously are already making decisions as, of, you know, is this a brand I actually want to work with? Do I buy into their values? Do I buy into what they're trying to achieve? Do I buy into the fact that actually they're able to deliver some great results for other clients that they work with? And that, I think, is part of the job of, you know, the brand side. When you then get into individual potential pursuits, the how do I target an organization? And we've seen the rise of account-based marketing now, yeah. which back in the day, I think we used to call strategic account planning yeah. from a sales perspective. <laughs> it's the same thing, Emperor's New Clothes a little bit. But that's a great opportunity, I think, for sales and marketing to really come together. And I think that's the kind of initiative that a lot of organizations can now use as a hook to really get that sales and marketing alignment done. Yeah, and, it, and it's about creating a continuum in the story as well, because I know um, sometimes the brand message is amazing and it's quite out in front of what the organization is able to deliver. And then you find, I think, that the gap between marketing and sales grows because the, the pressure either sits on one foot or the other. But if you can bring that collaborative conversation together where people understand, okay, this is the ambition of the brand, then this is how the products and services are going to align to delivering on that promise. These are the kinds of customers we want to target mm -hmm. because they're not only going to be profitable, um, they have a need for what we're trying to sell. And then these are the skills and the types of people that we need to go out and deliver that message. It, it works quite nicely, but I think we often don't take the time because it's mad. It's mad out there, right? Right. And we've got to hurry up. We've got to get it in. We've got to get the job done. Just almost find a warm body. That's right. <laughs> right? And I think it's, it's it, you're, you've hit the nail on the head there because, I again, I firmly believe that the talents, the skills, and the experiences that are required to make marketing and sales alignment work reside within organizations and within the people within those organizations. The challenge, as you rightly describe, is there is simply not the time in the day with all the other pressures to get those things done. And actually, you know, the number of studies that there've been, uh, I've read loads of things in things like Harvard Business Review and The Economist and so on and so forth, that talk incessantly about executives do not have enough time to start thinking strategy. Yeah. And actually, it's that focus on being able to develop strategy that I think helps you win out. You have to have a strategy and you have to be able to execute against that strategy. And unfortunately, these things are not things that are delivered in a month or a quarter. They are things that take time. And you're absolutely right to identify market pressure and the short term view on what have we achieved this quarter? What have we achieved this year? Hands to the pumps, because we all know what it's like <laughs> in the last week of the quarter, where it's just get the deals across the line. And suddenly people forget about, actually, these are the things we are working towards in a much longer term. The companies that do do that, and I've seen some privately owned companies that are very good at saying, actually, it's not just about how we close out the deal this quarter. It's about how we build a foundation for repeatable predictable, consistent revenue growth. And profitable growth as well. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, well, profitable, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because sometimes sometimes you do just chase numbers, right? But you, do. you always have to remain profitable to, to stay in the game. Um, in another discussion, we were talking about talent and yes. retaining talent. And yes. the numbers are a bit staggering in sales, anywhere from sort of 27 to 35% um, turnover per year. And in some organizations, it's probably sadly worse. When you've got that kind of turnover, how do you then factor that in? Um, or is it an opportunity? Because if what we're talking about somewhat is mindset, then do we see what is a challenge to the business on one hand as a gift on the other? 
I think it can be. It is an opportunity to then change the paradigm of how you operate. Um, but equally, you also need to retain some corporate knowledge because what ends up happening is if your turnover rate is too high, you're not retaining that knowledge. You know what it's like bringing yeah. on a new sales team. They're not going to hit the ground running on day one. You know, they may know enough after month one to be dangerous, <laughs> but they're still not going to be productive. And, you know, it takes time to ramp them up. Even if you go with a, a you're taking over somebody else's territory that maybe had opportunities, you've got to go back in and build those relationships from scratch. So that whatever pipeline was there goes, yeah. you know, moves to the right. Would you think that in organizations, though, where sales and marketing have achieved that stronger alignment and that, you know, really marching to the beat of the same drum, that despite the challenge that naturally turnover and sales represents, perhaps it might help shorten that onboarding time or that getting them to, to start bringing cash in the yeah. door because there's less confusion in the organization. The messaging is quite clear. We're all sort of... Yes, I, I think that's absolutely critical. But I also think it's down to how you um, construct a sales team and all of the support infrastructures that go around it, which includes, you know, everything that's happening in marketing. But it's not just that. It's also things like pre-sales, subject matter expertise, all these different things. Uh, even getting executives involved in particular deals. The deals that tend not to land, certainly in the large enterprise space, are the ones where you know one sales executive has a relationship with one person in the client organization yeah. they're facing off to because my mate Dave <laughs> said it's going to happen in three months' time, therefore we're all right. Hope is not a strategy. <laughs> right. Uh, but actually having a proper sales plan for a pursuit whereby you're mapping different people and different stakeholders to other people in your organization. So you have a broad church of contacts mm. within an organization. It may be the people that are in the line of business. It may be the people in finance, the people in procurement, some of the executive team building those executive bridges. Where you're getting into that, that requires orchestration and it requires support from different parts of the business because you may be running a business dinner somewhere to bring people in and do some thought leadership with them at the same time as you are having a demonstration of a product or service at the same time as you know you are having um, a meeting between your finance people and the finance people on the other on the other side of the table to talk about how the deal is <laughs> going to get structured now these are all things that would be happening concurrently in large deals yeah and oftentimes I see that that's a missing facet. Definitely. Well, I, I know in my experience, I'm, I'm sure you've had the same, marketing people actually quite like getting out with the customers and they'll usually offer, hey, I'd be happy to go to a dinner or come out and meet your customer, explain what we're doing, what, what's our route of travel. And I think sales is um, hesitant to, or maybe we just forget, but to utilize those resources. So I think when you achieve that alignment and you know you really feel like you're sort of standing in the ditch together. Yes. I think you do take advantage of that. And of course, everyone that sits outside of sales to a customer is far less threatening. And um, they seem to have less of an agenda or there's a perception that they're going to get perhaps um, a fuller answer, not because sales won't give it to them, but also they're not always empowered with all the information. So um, I think you're right. It is about really thinking more collaboratively, not just sales and marketing alignment, but the entire throughout organization. the organization Absolutely. and how you can create a partnership between your business and the customer's business. And, and obviously you can't scale that to every size of customer, but um, to be quite strategic, as you'd said, around where you should create not only those internal alignments, but the alignments with your prospects and customers. Absolutely. Um, I think we definitely see more success. Well, you, you have a rich tapestry of experience and you've been doing this with companies today. So can you give um, any examples that, you know, you may not be able to name names, but where where they've got it right and kind of maybe a peek at how they do it. How do they go from maybe being disconnected and walk that journey of becoming really partners uh, arm in arm in the sales process? Yeah. I mean, a, a great example that I was, I was talking to um, a client the other day, uh, actually, who's gone through this process and done an amazing job of it, actually. But the, the, the marketing leadership there um, has been around that business now for 20, 25 years and ha is well respected, understands the sales point of view, um, really works hand in glove with his sales counterpart. And that is absolutely front and center part of the, the, the success that they have. They've then also entirely agreed this is 
effectively the order of service as to how we get from unknown to known to suspect to prospect to pipeline to deal to close. And they've mapped all of that out and they know who has responsibility for each part of that value chain. And they're very, very clear that the benefit that each part of that process delivers to the next part. And I think that's part of how they've been so, so, so successful. And what's really interesting is that they've also done this alignment, not just around sales and marketing as functions, but sales and marketing technology stacks, mm. which I think is another really interesting facet because oftentimes in organizations, uh, sales will own something like the CRM because that's the sales tool. And then there will be a separate marketing tool that owns another view of your customer yeah. about how we contact them and how we talk to them. And the two aren't aligned. So people don't even know who's been contacted in various different organizations that they are trying to tap into at any given point in time. Yeah, the technology stack, I think, is, is a substantial hurdle in the process of sales and marketing alignment. Because it, if everyone's source of truth is different, um, or you even measure different things or you define things differently. Um, I, I know in one business I worked with, they had about 40 definitions of churn. So how then do I even know w what churn really is if we have no common understanding? And um, the technology stack problem is not an easy one to fix. It's expensive. Um, it can be lengthy. So it's around how do you create the right time of dialogue, at least with stakeholders, a common conversation, some common objectives, goals, yep. KPIs, um, compensation, whilst hopefully you can fix some of those technology distractions, yeah. if, I, if it's fair to call them that. And you know, it, it's not easy. No. It's not easy. And it goes back a little bit to what you were saying, you know, whilst it sounds simplistic, and it sounds like it's something that's, you know, why wouldn't we do that? Because it, it's, it's really straightforward, right? the realities of actually getting it done, I think, become really quite intricate because it, it impacts so many different parts of the business yeah. and so many different individuals within it that you really have to have almost that guiding coalition to, to make that happen. And where I found it's worked well in the past is where you start small. So it doesn't have to impact an entire organization. You may say there's one sector that we are selling into that we really want to focus on getting that marketing and sales alignment right and you pick one or two sales reps to work with directly with marketing and then they suddenly start seeing results in their pipeline credible pipeline that moves through sales stages really quickly that's properly qualified they have real insight into the deals Unweighted pipe becomes weighted pipe becomes closed deal in a faster sales cycle. As soon as you start seeing that happen with one or two people, guess what? Everyone else wants a piece of it. Yeah. And that, I think, is how you create that kind of a groundswell quite quickly. And that goes back to the point you raised right at the top of the conversation around culture, because now we have cultural alignment because my metrics are your metrics and your metrics are my metrics. And I've just helped you achieve something and you've helped me achieve the same thing. And now we're buddies, so let's make sure we carry on working that way. And actually, it's created this really good symbiotic relationship that now everybody else wants a piece of. Well, I think it lets salespeople go out and do what they do best. And it, it allows marketers to do what they do best instead of it getting quite convoluted because you're not aligned. So then you have people yep. stepping in and doing things that, you know, actually could be more obstructing than positive. And um, yeah, I think you're right. When you get something that works and accelerates sales, every other salesperson wants it because they're just competitive by nature. Yep. So if someone else has got a leg up on them, they they, they want in on that opportunity. Um, I think it's good that we're leaving people on a positive note because there could be a, you know, the conversation often is one that's worrisome, isn't it? We know we need to do it. We're not sure how to get there. But I think you've given us some really tangible, practical ways to get going. If you could offer any last pearls of wisdom to those watching this interview, mm. what would it be so that they can go out and sort of make this happen in their business as a sales leader? Just do it. <laughs> you know, it's it's one of these things. People can talk a good ball game, and I find that um, the thing that kills and stifles business more than anything else is just a lack of decision making and procrastination. Just start it off. Excellent.
I think you're right. It's all about, um, some say, beg for forgiveness, don't ask for permission, right? <laughs> you're spot on, Tamara. You're spot on. Excellent. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have this discussion with you today. No, thank um, you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. You're very welcome. Thanks for sharing all your pearls of wisdom. All right. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers.